Good day all you wonderful people, welcome to Adventure Together. My name's Al and today I am going to explain to you how I managed to organise my through hike of the Appalachian Trail as an international hiker. As you can tell from my accent, I am not from the United States and there are some difficulties that are involved when you are organising your through hike from abroad. As always with these videos, this is just my opinion and what I did to organise myself for my through hike. Your organisation might be different and you don't have to do everything the way I did. The first thing I wanted to talk about was visas. Now some people just decide to do the 90 day tourist visa, fly out of the country and then fly back and do another 90 days. That's perfectly fine if that's what you want to do, but personally I didn't want to go through the trouble and the expense of having multiple flights to deal with and also the hassle of getting off trail and getting back on trail. Also when you do that you have to talk to border security and tell them why you're coming back into the country just five or six days after you left. So instead I organized a B1, B2 tourist visa where I can stay in the country up to 180 days at a time. For me that was just far less hassle. There is an extra expense because the visas do cost quite a bit of money. With that you also have to go online and organize an appointment to go up to the consular and sometimes that date that they get after application is quite a few months after they actually put the application in. So if you want to do it the way that I did then you need to be organized and have it sorted several months in advance. The second thing I want to talk about is insurance. Now there were some people who are international hikers who didn't choose to get insurance on trail and if you want to take that risk again that's up to you. You, you want to roll the dice on that one go for it but personally I got my insurance through Safety Wing. Now you'll find my ambassador link to that down in the description where you can go straight Straight to safety wing and get the same insurance that I did. I'm not going to tell you what to do with insurance now that is up to you but personally I wouldn't go without insurance. The third thing to think about is how you're going to manage your money from abroad. For me I used my credit card when I was abroad and I set up a monthly direct debit so that it would automatically take any money that was owing on the credit card so I wouldn't actually have to pay any interest on the money that I had borrowed. I thought using a credit card would be better because that way I have payment insurance so that if my credit card gets scammed it will automatically refund me the money. I also didn't have to worry about how much I was spending. There was always going to be money there that I could use even if I I did go over my monthly budget. I wouldn't recommend anyone going to debt. Make sure that you keep a tight hold of your finances and you're always aware of what you're spending. The full thing is booking flights. Now when you get to the United States the border security might want to know what you're planning to be up to for the next six months and they might suspect that you're there for employment and if you're on a tourist visa that's a no-no so make sure that you have all of your plans ready and you can explain what you're going to be doing not just I'm going to go hiking but actually say I'm going to start here and I'm going to go visit at these places I'm going to go there. If you went to a visa interview you'll be used to trying to prove why you're going into the country and it might help to have that level of evidence with you when you hit border security. Another tip for proving that you're not going to be planning to stay in the country is to have a return flight booked. Now when you're booking the flight you don't know when you will want to leave so have an open return or something that you can change your return date. The fifth thing is try and get there with plenty of time to organize yourself. If you're coming from abroad there might be some things that you want to buy to take with you on the trail that you might not be able to get in your own country. So if you need to do some shopping or you need to go to REI or Walmart to get some food to go onto trail, think about getting there more than one day early. If you've got one day to organize yourself it can be a little bit stressful. So I'd recommend having at least two days where you can organize yourself and go and get the food that you need and any last minute equipment or things from REI and you can organize yourself properly before you hit trail. The next thing you'll want to do when you're catching your flight is to make sure that you separate out any items that they might consider dangerous and put those into your checked luggage. Anything like tent pegs, trekking poles, your cooking gear, Obviously, if you're taking a camping knife with you, all of that stuff, just make sure you check it. For me, I just chucked everything into a cardboard box. Some people recommend going to a charity shop and getting an old bag and then donating it to Goodwill. Personally, like I said, I just got a cardboard box and uh, that was thrown away when I got to the hotel in Atlanta. When you get to the US, I would recommend that you invest in getting a SIM card. Some people organize SIM cards before they go, they get an eSIM. Personally, I found a better deal when I went with Straight Talk, which I got from Walmart. And you can get the top up cards from Walmarts along the way. The deal that I was on with Straight Talk was a little bit expensive. It was $40, but for that, I got 10 gigabytes of data, unlimited calls, and unlimited text. 
I was trekking with Holy Roller and Red Panda every day. I really didn't need to call anybody else. So those calls and texts were pretty much redundant. But with vlogging on trail and needing to upload my videos, having that extra data bump was really, really handy. If you don't need that, they do have cheaper deals and there are lots of other competitors out there. Other than needing it for the internet, it was also very handy to have a phone, not just to keep in touch with the people around me, but also to ring shuttle drivers or ring hostels and book accommodation. Personally, I think that if you're planning to be on trail for a whole six months, then it is worth investing in a SIM card of some sort, whether it be an eSIM or an actual physical SIM. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was food packages and sending food to yourself up trail. Before I left to start the Appalachian Trail, I did some research online and I found an article that told me about places that I might want to send food to myself. Being that I was on a vegan diet, it was important to make sure that I always had food available to me. And there were three packages that I ended up sending myself. One of them was at Neil Gap. The next one was at The Knock. And the third one was at Fontana Village. When I went there, I felt all three of those places would have been hard to make a vegan resupply at a cheap rate. So I was very happy to have packages in those places. Other than a couple of places in New York, I felt like I didn't need any other packages. There are lots and lots of places along the way that you can get a resupply easy, but you might want to send a box to yourself just for cost reasons. So get online and talk to people who've done the hike before and see what they say about sending food to yourself. This is where the couple of extra days of prep will come in useful because you'll be able to go to Walmart or wherever else you want to get your food and put it into separate boxes and then take them to the post office. It might be that it takes you a whole day to go and get the food and box it up separately and send it out. It might even take more than that. So don't underestimate how long this might take you. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was the problem that international hikers have trying to send their gear to somebody. American hikers don't have this problem because they're able to ship all of their stuff back home and then ask a family member or friend to send it back to them when they need it. But as international hikers, we might not know anybody in the country to send our gear to. And it's frustrating to think that we're going to walk all summer with our full winter gear on our back. So if you don't want to carry all of your unused winter gear on your back for the whole trail, then there is another way that I can suggest for you. And that is to, again, get online, start talking to people in groups, and you might be able to talk to a trail angel or be put in touch with a trail angel that will accept your packages being sent to them. And as long as you pay for the shipping, then they will ship it back to you when you need it. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was keeping your valuables safe. Now, as an international hiker, you have to carry your passport all the way through the trail and you need to keep that documentation safe and also dry. If you're on the Appalachian Trail like I was, then it rains a lot and everything you get will get wet at some point. So I have my passport, my insurance documents, any other things like cash all wrapped up in a babushka doll style of Ziploc bags. I had about four or five Ziploc bags inside Ziploc bags so that when those Ziploc bags got wet and my bag got saturated from the rain as it often did. The things that were most important did not get wet. One thing that you might see me wearing in my Appalachian Trail videos was a fanny pack or a bum bag or whatever you call it. I always kept that on me and my documents were in that so that if I ever put down my backpack somewhere and my backpack was stolen, my cash, my passport and my insurance documents were all still on me. This also meant that when I was doing river crossings, if I had have fallen over and I needed to ditch my pack, I would still have everything dry inside my fanny pack and that wouldn't have got washed down the river. That would always stay with me. And the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about today was dealing with injuries. Now I had a couple of injuries, although I am so lucky because all of my injuries were minor and I was able to walk through them. But there are some international hikers out there, it might even be you, who goes out there and does get injured in quite a serious way. You can't get insurance for an injury after the fact. So if you need medical care and you don't want to be paying horrendous bills, have that insurance before you go. The second thing is to budget for time, budget for contingencies. If you roll an ankle and you need to spend a week off trail just to recuperate it in a hotel, have the contingency of money to pay for, somewhere to stay and secondly have budgeted the time to be able to take a week off trail and still be able to finish your through hike. It would be so frustrating to get so far into the trail and roll an ankle or hurt yourself by falling and then have to take a week off trail and know that now you won't be able to finish your through hike. So that's it. That's my basic list of things that I did as an international hiker to organize my through hike of the Appalachian Trail. If you've got any other questions or comments, then please leave them below in the comment section. If you like this video, please leave a like. Please consider subscribing and share this video to anybody that you know that likes camping, hiking and adventure travel. And for now, that's it from me. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you in the next one.
there are some difficulties when you're organizing a through trip, uh, through trip, 